one, I'm going to be reading from Ready Player One. Uh, this is a great book for summer reading, um, especially for high schoolers. If you're interested in something that's really action-packed. I think it's also really interesting to read this book since the movie just came out. It's always really interesting to see how a movie differs from the book and how a producer, writer takes um, elements from the book, um, but then like condenses them or also adds in new elements. Uh, me personally, I think the book is actually better than the movie, um, but you'll have to read it to judge for yourself, all right? So Ready Player One, I'm gonna read some from the beginning. Everyone my age remembers where they were and what they were doing when they first heard about the contest. I was sitting in my hideout watching cartoons when the news bulletin broke in on my video feed, announcing that James Halliday had died during the night. I'd heard of Halliday, of course, everyone had. He was the video game designer responsible for creating the Oasis, a massively multiplayer online game that had gradually evolved into a globally networked virtual reality most of humanity now used on a daily basis. The unprecedented success of the Oasis had made Halliday one of the wealthiest people in the world. At first, I couldn't understand why the media was making such a big deal of the billionaire's death. After all, the people of planet Earth had other concerns. The ongoing energy crisis, catastrophic climate change, widespread famine, poverty, and disease. Half a dozen wars, wars, you know, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Normally, the news feeds didn't interrupt everyone's interactive sitcoms and soap operas unless someone re something really major had happened, like the outbreak of some new killer virus or another major city vanishing in a mushroom cloud, big stuff like that. As famous as he was, Halliday's death should have warranted only a brief segment on the evening news, so the unwashed masses could shake their heads in envy when the newscasters announced the obscenely large amount of money that would be doled out to the rich man's heirs. But that was the rub. James Halliday had no heirs. He had died a 67-year-old bachelor with no living relatives and, by most accounts, without a single friend. He spent the last 15 years of his life in self-imposed isolation, during which time, if the rumors were to be believed, he'd gone completely insane. So the real jaw-dropping news that January morning, the news that had everyone from Toronto to Tokyo cropping in their cornflakes, concerned the contents of Halliday's last will and testament and the fate of his vast fortune, Halliday had prepared a short video message, along with instructions that it be released to the world media at the time of his death. He also arranged to have a copy of the video emailed to every single Oasis user that same morning. I still remember hearing that familiar electronic chime when it arrived in my inbox, just a few seconds after I saw that first news bulletin. His video message was actually a meticulously constructed short film titled Anorax Invitation. A famous eccentric, Halliday had harbored a lifelong obsession with the 1980s, the decade during which he'd been a teenager. An Anorax Invitation was crammed with obscure 80s pop culture references, nearly all of which were lost on me the first time I viewed it. The entire video was just over five minutes in length, and in the days and weeks that followed, it would become the most scrutinized piece of film in history, surpassing it, even the Zapruder film in the amount of painstaking frame-by-frame -frame analysis devoted to it. My entire generation would come to know every second of Halliday's message by heart. Anorak's invitation began with the sound of trumpets, the opening of an old song called Dead Man's Party. The song plays over a dark screen for the first few seconds until the trumpets are joined by a guitar, and that's when Halliday appears. But he's not a 67-year-old man ravaged by time and illness. He looks just as he did on the cover of Time magazine back in 2014. A tall, thin, healthy man in his early 40s with unkempt hair and his trademark horn rimmed glasses. He's also wearing the same clothing he wore in the Time cover photo, faded jeans and a vintage Space Invaders t-shirt. Halliday is at a high school dance being held in a large gymnasium. He's surrounded by teenagers whose clothing, 
hairstyles, and dance moves all indicate that the time period is the late 1980s. Halliday is dancing too, something no one ever saw him do in real life. Grinning manically, he spins in rapid circles, swinging his arms and head in time with the song, flawlessly circling through several signature 80s dance moves. But Halliday has no dance partner. He is, as the saying goes, dancing with himself. A few lines of text appear briefly at the lower left-hand corner of the screen, listing the name of the band, the song's title, the record label, and the year of release, as, it, as if it were an old music video airing on MTV. Oingo Boingo, Dead Man's Party, MCA Records, 1985. When the lyrics kick in, Halliday begins to lip-sync along, still um, got gyrating, all dressed up with nowhere to go, walking with a dead man over my shoulder. Don't run away, it's only me. He abruptly stops dancing and makes a cutting motion with his right hand, silencing the music. At the same time, the dancers in the gymnasium behind him vanish, and the scene around him suddenly changes. Halliday now stands at the front of the funeral parlor, next to an open casket. A second, much older Halliday lies inside the casket his body emaciated and ravaged by cancer. Shiny quarters cover each of his eyelids. The younger Halliday gazes down at the corpse of his older self with mock sadness, then turns to address the assembled mourners. Halliday snaps his fingers and, scroll, and a scroll appears in his right hand. He opens it with a flourish and it infers to the floor, unraveling down the aisle in front of him. He breaks the fourth wall addressing the viewers and begins to read. I, James Donovan Halliday, being of sound mind and disposing memory, do hereby make, publish, and declare this instrument to be my last will and testament, hereby revoking any and all wills and codicles by me at, the, at any time here, heretofore made. He continues reading faster and faster, plowing through several more paragraphs of legalese until he's speaking so rapidly that the words are unintelligible. Then he stops abruptly. Forget it, he says. Even at that speed, it would take me a month to read the whole thing. Sad to say, I don't have that kind of time. He drops the scroll and it vanishes in the shower of gold dust. Let me just give you the highlights. The funeral parlor vanishes and the scene changes once again. Halliday now stands in front of an immense bank vault door. My entire estate, including a controlling share of stock in my country, in my company, Gregarious Simulation Systems, is to be placed in escrow until such time as a single condition I have set forth in my will is met. The first individual to meet that condition will inherit my entire fortune, currently valued in excess of 200 and $40 billion. The vault door swings open and Halliday walks inside. The interior of the vault is enormous and it contains a huge stack of gold bars, roughly the size of a large house. Here's the dough I'm putting up for grabs, Halliday says, grinning broadly. What the heck? You can't take it with you, right? Halliday leans against the stack of gold bars and the camera pulls in tight on his face. Now I'm sure you're wondering, what do you have to do to get your hands on all this moolah? Well, hold your horses, kids. I'm getting to that. He pauses dramatically. He expresses changing to that of a child about to reveal a very big secret. And that is why you should read Ready Player One, The Seller.